27. While Samuel Clugarsh was gone, Clarence Ojimbo went around the room tapping all the scientific gadgets. He seemed to be listening to the taps. He'd keep tapping until he was satisfied, and then he'd move on to another machine. I couldn't hear any difference between the taps. Most of your instruments were out of adjustment, he said to Samuel Clugarsh when he returned. I've got them pretty well tuned for you. Just try not to move them around too much. They're pretty primitive and delicate. Now, Clarence Stewart Jimbo continued between bites of yogurt. I'm going to explain to all of you about the so-called so lost continents. It seems that we weren't making much progress before, so I'm going to try to just blast right along and maybe you'll get the general idea. People tend to believe only what they can see. It's perfectly natural and reasonable. But what if everybody saw in black and white and you could see colors? Chances are no one would believe that colors existed. They might think you were crazy if you kept talking about colors, but the colors would exist just the same even if not everybody could see them. Everyone with me so far? We were. Suppose I told you I could see something that you couldn't see, taking into account that I'm Venusian and have already demonstrated that I'm able to know things which I have no way of knowing, like the fact that today Samuel Kogarsh's undershorts are white with little red hearts on them. That's absolutely right, Samuel Kogarsh said. Would, be, would you be willing to concede, just for the sake of argument, that I can see things which ordinary Earth people can't see? Yes. Okay. That's reasonable. Okay, Clarence Ujimbo continued. Having granted that I am able to see things that you can't, and having noticed that I am a really nice guy, besides which I have no reason to lie to you, are you willing to believe that, in addition to us four, there are others in this room? For some reason, this idea struck me as sort of scary. I felt a shiver. In fact, Clarence Ujimbo said, there are a whole lot of people in this room. There are some people about nine feet tall sitting around and drinking cups of flegics. There are also some people walking through here on their way to someplace else. There are also some people cooking. There are also some people making tables and chairs out of wood. There are also some people sleeping. What's more, the people drinking flegics can't see us or, us or the people walking, the people cooking, the people working, or the people sleeping. The people walking can't see us, and the, or the people drinking flegics, or the people cooking, or the people working, or the people sleeping. Are you starting to get the picture? What's flegics? Alan Mendelssohn asked. It's a hot drink, similar to hot chocolate, usually served in a cup with two marshmallows and whipped cream, Clarence Sir Jimbo said. But that's not the point. The point is that the same, in the same space, there are at least six different bunches of people, or beings, doing different things, and not interfering with any of the other bunches of people, or beings. What has this got to do with lost continents? Samuel Kogarsh wanted to know. Wait a minute, Alan Mendelssohn said. I think I've got it. Those places where the others are, drinking flegic, walking, working, and so forth, those are the lost continents. You've got it, Lawrence Jimbo said. But continents are places, Samuel Kogarsh said. I've got at least 15 books in the front of the shop that tell, you, tell how there's proof of these continents used to exist. How did all these people get into that ghost-like state? Did they die or what? One of the reasons, Clarence or Jimbo said, that you haven't got a bigger, more successful mystical occult book shop is that you've read all the books. What makes you think that the people I'm telling you about are in ghost state like Limbo? What, what do you suppose they'd say if I appeared before them and told them, told them that the three of you are sitting here in the back of a bookshop? They'd think we were like ghosts, Samuel Kogarsh said. Of course they would, Clarence or Jimbo said. They can't see you, they can't hear you, they can't feel, smell, or taste you. If I could persuade them, persuade them to take my word for your being here at all, the best they could do would be to assume that you were insubstantial, like spirits. But you're not, are you? Samuel Klugar scratched his head. No, I'm really here. And they're really there, Clarence Jumbo said. If you go to some tribe in the Amazon jungle and tell them all about Los Angeles, California, they're going to have a hard time believing you. Even if you show them pictures, the best they're going to be able to do is fix up their idea of Los Angeles, California, so that it fits with their everyday experience. Mr. Yojimbo, Alan Mendelssohn said, how come you can see all this stuff? Is it because you're a Venusian? That's right, Clarence Yojimbo said. Obviously, people from other planets are going to have extra powers that Earth people don't have. Anybody who has ever watched television knows that. But, and this is interesting, there's always been contact between these different, let's call them, planes of existence. That's where all the stories about Atlantis and Mu and Lemuria and Nafsulia 
and Waka Waka come from in the first place. People from the, this plane of existence have stumbled on information from one or more of the others. Sometimes they even get a quick look. How does that happen, I asked. Well, it's like this, Clarence Ujimbo said. Right now, I'm sort of tuned in on Nafsulia. That's the, pl that's the plane I described on which people are walking from one place to another. It so happens that this room is right in the middle of the main street of Nafsu City. It's four o'clock in the afternoon on a business day. The Nafsuvians have the same sort of time sequence as you do. So hundreds and thousands of people have walked, have passed through this room all day long. Not one of them has noticed that he or she is walking through a room. Maybe one in 5,000 will have a funny sensation just for a second while we're while walking through here. Maybe one in 10,000 will have a funny sensation and pay any attention to it. Maybe one in 100,000 will suspect they have come in contact with something not visible in their ordinary world. But they won't quite know what it is. One in a million or fewer will actually have a pretty good idea of what's going on when they walk through this room. And maybe one in 10 million at the most will actually get a glimpse of us. And that one in 10 million won't be able to glimpse us every time he comes this way. It'll just happen at random, maybe a few times in his life. Now one Nafsulian in a hundred million will be able to really see what's going on here just as clearly as I can see all of them. If that Nafsulian tells the other Nafsulians what he's seen, they'll take him to the booby hatch. He's a pretty intelligent fellow, so he doesn't say anything. Now, that intelligent Nafsu Nafsulian gets a look one day at, let's say, the Bermuda Triangle Chili Parlor. Chili is unknown to Nafsulia, although they have all the ingredients to make it. He watches the owner of the Bermuda Triangle Chili Parlor make up a batch of green death chili. He sees how it's done, and he makes them too. The other Nafsulians love it, but they also know that nothing of the kind has ever existed or been thought of in Nafsulia. They want to know how the fellow who made it got the idea. He tells them that they made the chili like that in Hog Hogborough. Where's Hogborough? It isn't on any Nafsulian map. Nobody's ever heard of it. Yet there's the chili. It had to come from somewhere. Are you getting the picture? Yes, I said. The Nafsulians assume that if Hogborough doesn't exist now, it must have existed in the past. Since it doesn't exist anymore, something must have happened to it. So they make up a story, Alan Mendelssohn broke in, about how Hogborough used to be a mighty continent, but it sank into the ocean. That's it exactly, Clarence Jimbo said. Now why am I bothering to tell you all this? Because you like us, Samuel Clagar said. Because I like you, and something more important, Clarence Jimbo said. A while ago, I told Alan and Leonard that they were the first Earth people ever to be able to turn what you call twi- <laughs> Sorry. A bug on me. Because I like you, and something more important, Clarence Jimbo said. A while ago, I told Alan and Leonard that they were the first people, Earth people ever to be able to turn on what you call State 26 on and off at will. I also told them that they are using that power to do simple tricks was wrong because it would cause them to be unable to find out what the power is really good for. What that power is good for is to enable people to see and hear what is happening on other planes of existence. That's how Venusians do it. Any person equipped with what you call State 26 can learn to travel in and out of the various parallel planes of existence. Remember, I said that some people have always been able to experience State 26 at random moments. Those are the people who get little blips from other planes of existence. Even the guy who discovered Green Death Chili couldn't do such a thing at will. But these two boys can learn to do it just, as, just the way I do. By the way, Mr. Dujimbo, Alan Mendelssohn asked, how exactly did you get to Earth? A good question, Clarence Ojimbo said. I come from the sixth existential plane on Venus. To get to the sixth existential plane on Venus to Waka Waka plane on Earth is easy as taking a bus to West Kangaroo Park, where you guys live. Then equipped with what you call State 26, I can come from Waka Waka plane directly to this one. If I want to, I can get back to my home planet in, on Venus in about an hour and 20 minutes, which I don't want to do because they're having a terrific snowstorm right there, right, right there right now. Do you mean to say we can do that too, I asked? When you learn how, Clarence Jumbo said. How do we learn? Read my book. <laughs>